Thank you. It is so great to be here this morning. Welcome to Hillhurst United Church. We are located on the beautiful land of the Treaty 7 people, the Sutsina, the Blackfoot, and the Stony Nakoda, and Alberta Calgary is also home to Métis Region 3. We are so glad that you're here with us today. My name is Andrea Irwin. I am one of the ministers here. Uh, preaching this morning is John Pentland, who is sitting over there. Give a wave, John. Awesome. Thank you. That was good timing. Uh, welcome to this community of faith this morning. There are lots of people in this uh, space that I have not yet had the pleasure of meeting. Some of you are back for the first time in two years, and some of you are here for the very first time. So let's give a round of applause to all of you who are bold enough to show up this morning. It's so great to be here in this full sanctuary. We have a banner out front of this community that says, whoever you are, wherever you're at, join us on the journey. And what we mean by that is really whoever you are, however you identify, whatever your gender expression or identity, whatever your sexual orientation, whatever your ethnicity, whatever your economic status, however many Instagram followers you have, you are welcome here in this space and we are so proud to know you. And if you haven't introduced yourself to one of us, we do our very best to get to each and every one of you, but it doesn't always happen. So just come forward and introduce yourself. We would, we would love to meet you. I'm going to take a moment and invite up Anne yates Burge, our executive director, to share a couple of important community announcements before we get going this morning. Let's move this out of your way. Hi, Anne. Hi, Andrea. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Anne. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah. Nice to meet That's you. That's how we do it. Yeah. I'm super excited because I've seen at least 15 people that I haven't seen in two years today. They're over here. There, there, there. Yeah, look, Bryce Payton's back. This is, I was like, are you, are you lost? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so really excited to see so many of you back from the summer holidays and back from COVID. A um, couple of announcements very quickly. We have our first hybrid congregational meeting on Wednesday night at 7 o'clock p.m. You can be here in the sanctuary or you can be online. So go to hillhurstunited.life and sign up for that. We're going to be talking about finance. We have a new treasurer. We have a new board, some new board members. We have a renovation update and we have plans for our South Campus, otherwise known as Living Spirit. After the uh, service today, we'll have a barbecue outside. Thank you to Doug Francis, Barry, Marilyn, and Francis for helping us with that piece. Um, Garage sale slash junk for Jesus um, <laughs> is happening. We need your junk um, to fill up the stage. We've started collecting already, so if you'd like to put your stuff on the stage, it needs to be new, sort of new, kind of new. Somebody sort of wants to buy it, but not a lot of, too, not too much junk, um, but no furniture. Um, and the reason for furniture is no one will take the furniture afterwards. So no furniture, but everything else is possible to bring. Um, that, the actual garage sale is September 24th and 25th, and tell your, uh, all your friends. Um, children's Choir is starting this week. Our new preschool program is starting this week. Adult Choir is starting this week. Anything else? Oh, Spiritual Nurture is starting this week. Basically everything. Everything starting this week. If you're interested in something, it's starting this week. Please go to hillhurstunited.com this week and look at it. I think that's about it for me. Yeah, and after the barbecue, uh, myself and a couple of young adults in this community are going to go and float the Bow River. We figure this is going to be one of the last chances we have for this year. It's going to be 30 degrees out. So if you are interested in doing that, you can come and find me after the service. We're going to meet at 1 o'clock at Angel's Cafe just in Parkdale. Uh, and I have a three-person giant flamingo that you're welcome to ride if you don't have your own floaty. So. And Daniel has a seven-person one. Yeah. And so if you we're haven't well gotten taken in, care Yeah, of. but if you haven't gotten invited... And because you can come. I know. Out, so just float you, can come. you can come. You can come. Come, meet us at Angels. Happy Sunday. <laughs> Happy Sunday, everyone. I invite you all to just take a moment and settle yourselves into this space. Some of you might come into a space like this and think to yourself, wow, I immediately feel like I am drawn into something sacred. Others of you might be here for the first time. You might be feeling a little bit sticky, a little bit uncomfortable. You're sitting in the back two pews. Don't worry, we won't make eye contact. We're glad that you're here. Some of you might be feeling a little uncomfortable. Your sciatic issues are acting up on these pews. So I just invite you, however you are feeling right now, to just be here. Let's take a couple of breaths together. 
when we gather in a space like this, it is good to remind ourselves that God is as close to us as the very air that we breathe. So let's worship. I invite you all to stand, and Amanda is going to lead us with the, well, Greg's going to lead us with the organ. Amanda has chosen a hymn for us this morning. This piece is called Let There Be Peace on Earth, and it was a favorite of Queen Elizabeth. So I invite you to rise. <coughs> Please be seated. And before you fact check that, I did indeed give you the wrong title. That song was called Praise My Soul, O God of Heaven. We are not perfect here. <laughs> so letting go of all that brought us here this morning, the anticipation, maybe a little bit of chaos, maybe the ritual, or maybe some kind of desperation. Whatever brought us here this morning, we let ourselves fall into a space where we are held. Held by the strength of this community. Take a moment and just look around at everyone who's here with you today. Held by the strength of this community and also by God. So let's for a moment experience that weightlessness of being held together as we join together in our opening prayer. And the words are going to be on the screen there. Let's pray. We pause in this moment. We breathe. We open. We let go. We listen. Be among us. Spirit, be in our time that we might see and know more clearly. In silence, we dwell in your presence, Holy One. Let's 
sing together the words that Jesus left with us. this is a community of story. There are the living stories that we bring in here each time we enter the building, and there are the ancient stories in our text shared by people dealing with hardship, people who are celebrating overwhelming joy, people who are just trying to find their way in the world, and people who are trying their very best to experience God in all that they do. These are stories that give light to us in hard times, and they are stories of the one who came to be that light. Not every one of the stories that we hear in this place resonates with us and what we are going through in that very moment, but every one of these stories promises us that we are loved, that we are forgiven, and that we are set free. So however we arrive today, let us dare to believe that good news. Thanks be to God. Speaking of stories, you have heard it said if you've been in this community before that we are a seven-day-a-week church. And if you haven't been here before, you've never heard that before, you will hear it a lot. We are a seven-day-a-week church here at Hillhurst. And so we're going to invite Anne up again to share with you just a snapshot. You've already heard our announcements about the week coming up, but to share with us a snapshot of what our past week has looked like, just to paint a bit of a picture. Get your paintbrush, Anne. I enjoy doing service with you. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> Not that I don't enjoy doing service with you, John, but... <laughs> We've had our fun. So just a little glimpse of behind the scenes. So Andrea, John, myself, Sarah, uh, Amanda, Greg, uh, the core team of people, and Danielle were, were all busy this week. We met with Chinookwins region around a second campus, which is formerly Spe a Living Spirit United. Had a great meeting around what that's going to look like. It's quite, in, quite exciting. We met with our contemporary lead, uh, William Brooke, about the plans for the new meditation service that's going to start over on Tuesday evenings at our south campus. Our renovation team was busy behind the scenes planning our Kitchen demolition. <laughs> yeah, we were slowed down by a little report called asbestos, but we've, we're mitigating it. I it's think okay. actually, I think maybe there's an opportunity for us to turn that into a spiritual practice. If anyone needs to like let something out, they can bring a sledgehammer and we can go at it. Oh together. no, no, we have people, but we have boxes we're gonna fill with dishes that if you really need to feel like you need to fill boxes with dishes, okay. the boxes it's, have it's, been ordered. It's not quite the same, but okay. that's right. we'll talk. Andrea and I had some great interviews with people for uh, our children, youth, and family role, and uh, happy to say we think we found someone that's going to fit the role nicely. Uh, we, I met with our current uh, treasurer, Dave Harker, and our incoming treasurer, D Jim Wilson, to have assure us a, a smooth uh, transition of what it looks like financially around here. Alan Kidd came in to talk with me about our financial audit and review. John worked in his sermon. He worked on his sermon. He worked on his sermon. <laughs> and then he coordinated with the music team and a ton of pastoral care and appointments. And then he got off Charlotte to junior high. Woo! Let that sink in. <laughs> 
Sarah, Sarah was buried in the uh, creation of the annual report that you're going to see on, uh, at the congregational meeting. And your board of directors met for the very first time together as this board has never bet, met together physically because of COVID. And we had dinner together and made um, plans for the congregational meeting, which is Wednesday. We also were behind the scenes talking about our second service that's happening on October the 9th, uh, where we have two services, one at 9.05 and one at 10.45. And I'm happy to say we finally have people in the Heritage Room for the first time this morning. So Yay. the survey worked. The numbers look good. So anyway, that was a behind the scenes uh, little account of what it looked like. It was a busy week. Yeah. It was happy, a, happy Sunday. Yeah, it was a busy week. Uh, that's one week. And that explains why in a group chat that Anne and Sarah and John and I have, there was a string of Elton John gifts saying, I'm still standing. So here we are. <laughs> uh, this is a community of people who do not sleep. And that comes from a place of deep passion and care and concern and excitement for helping a world in which needs never sleep. So if that is a community that you are proud to be involved with, if that is something that you would like to participate in, we invite you to do that in a few different ways. I forgot to bring my little QR code sheet up, but if there's one in your pew, you can hold it up so the people behind you can see it. There's a card. Thank you. Awesome. Those have uh, little pictures. You can flash your iPhone over and you can connect with us. You can volunteer with us and you can offer financial contribution to this community. And all of those forms of offering are greatly appreciated as we work to do more in this community, in this city, and in the wider world. So thank you for those contributions. At this point in the service, whether you are joining us online, everyone give a wave to our online community. We have a hundred people online on Sunday mornings who are not with us in person. Whether you are online or whether you're sitting here in the pews, we have an opportunity for you to greet one another. We call this in the service the passing of the peace. And this is an opportunity for us to practice what it means to be in relationship with the stranger, with the person who we fought with over coffee this morning, with the person who smells in the pew next to us, whoever it is that is with you. I'm not, I'm not pointing fingers. It could be me for all you know. We are offering you an opportunity to greet one another and to be in this space really together. Uh, and as we do that, the kids are welcome to go off to Kids Space with Bethany in the back corner and with Herman. Um, so I invite the children to do that. So please rise. And friends, however you wish to pass the peace, a fist bump, a peace sign, a hug, a handshake, peace be with you.
Good morning. I'm so thrilled to be with you all, and, and uh, Amanda asked me to sing today. Uh, the title of this song is called Peace. Seems like a bit of a theme for this service. Um, and whenever I have to learn a new song, it tends to be a little bit of a mantra for me during the week because I listen to it over and over. And um, this one um, is particularly meaningful, and I hope it's meaningful to you. One of the lines is, peace holds me when I'm broken, sweet peace that passes understanding. And I'm so thrilled that we can come together in community and remind ourselves of the peace that um, we have in God and Jesus. I hope this speaks to your heart today. When my mind is like a battlefield And my heart is overcome by fear And hope seems like a ship that's lost at sea I'm tempted to run and hide. Your gentle whisper reaches out to me.
This has been quite a week uh, in, our, in our world, frankly, and in our country. Uh, and we are so pleased this morning to share with you a short video from Tony Snow, who's uh, been in leadership here at the church, but with the region uh, in our Indigenous studies, uh, as we all seek to be about truth and reconciliation. And as we heard the news uh, about Northern Saskatchewan, he wants to offer these words to us as we remember today. James Smith Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, nationally and internationally. This strikes at our community's vulnerability because we don't see these kinds of mindless extremist acts in our communities. And though there is ongoing suffering on reserves from social ills like addiction, homelessness, poverty and violence, these stabbings present a new threat, not just to our social stability and our cultural norms, but to our humanity. We see the way in which mass tragedy affects whole communities. Uvalde is one terrible example we continue to see in the news. And now James Smith Cree Nation is another. As people of faith, we are motivated to reach out to those affected, those in grief, those who have suffered loss. We must also check in with one another, with those disaffected by intergenerational trauma who may be spiraling in pain. Those who feel this tragedy in a long line of violence and unending trauma, those who must again pick themselves up and go on. Our traditional ways speak of healing the body and the weary soul, tending to the spirit of each of us, to remember our humanity and mercy at a time like this. There will be time for accountability and processing the horror of what has happened. But as people of faith, we must lead with our heart reach out to one another, hold your loved ones close, offer your prayers to the families of this tragedy, to a community in shock, and remind them that they, we are brothers and sisters and relatives, children of God with whom we seek a better healing world. At this time when we gather, we bring those kinds of sorrow and also joy and concern and so as we come I'll invite Greg to play the piece of music that'll be part of our refrain in a moment and then we'll collect our joys and our sorrows. section we've been waiting <laughs> and you're here people to remember joys concerns yeah yeah for people who are finally perhaps doing a celebration of life for those who died during COVID I remember uh, Chuck Nowlin who died this past week sits in row three over there uh, with Patty and Jill's uh, father who died on Wednesday. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To remember our new king. To remember our new king. Joys, sorrows, yeah. For Kim's husband who has been sick. People ill of body, mind, or spirit. brother and his wife who just got married and those who celebrate weddings in fact I have one next Saturday my son so there you go yeah good, good to see you
Nice, the people in the kidney marks. Were they going yesterday? Did they go yesterday too? Or? Thank you for the people who are part of marches, yeah, and uh, support. For Keith, uh, who passed away, Keith's last name? Savenson, who passed away this week. Tina. Sorry? For a place to live by the end of the month. For the queen and her family. For the death of your brother and those who are in grief this day. Yeah. For our new family from Kiev who are at the school in Sunnyside. Yeah. for your mom and others uh, seniors who are in time of transition moving which is harder when you're older and, and relinquishing many things in their life yeah our friends who got married and those who are in Washington and uh, wildfires there we have waited to come in this room. Yeah. For a brother who's got injuries that he's recovering from, yeah. For the both and, I'll call it, of the monarchy as we learn about colonialism and as we honor um, part of our heritage and the greatness of that. So thank you. There might be things you wish you said, but they're in your throat. They are God's words, spoken or silent. We gather them all together as we sing, Be Still. the delight of changing colored hair for voices who have shared their sorrow, concern and gratitude for open doors in this building that welcomes people whoever they are, wherever they're at everyone here has made time to be here maybe deep time deep time of remembering Deep time of knowing. Deep Kairos time. Give thanks for the length of this summer season in Calgary. For warm evenings, full gardens, fresh air. For fast flowing streams and snow capped mountains. For the laughter of children the gentleness of an evening walk with a friend or lover. For work to engage with, for decisions to be made, for friendships rekindled, for the gathering in this place 
with people who are new to us and us to them. We pray this day for your world, for our country, for violence and sorrow experienced in Saskatchewan, for those who experience hate crimes in PEI, and those who are heard yet again about another shooting. Our world is broken. Our world is angry. Help us to pause. Help us to respond, not react. And in our listening, find the compassion that is part of each and every one of us. Pray for those ill of body, mind, or spirit. Those who won't come here. Those who can't come here. Those who have arrived for the first time. And those who have returned. Be in this time, O oh God, as in this space we open our hearts and our minds and our bodies to you in silence. thanks this day for the promise that you, O oh God, are known. Be with us as we sing. When I was a boy, my parents had one of these, and we read out of it every day, and we called it the good book. When I went to seminary, I learned that it wasn't a book. It was originally called the books. And it was only with the printing press in the 15th century, 16th century, that it all got bound under one cover. And in fact, it was a collection of books of all kinds of different stuff. There's a hymn book, there's a legal book, there's a history book, there's myths, there's stories, there's legend, there's propaganda. And um, there's also some philosophy. And it's out of the philosophy today that I want to read in Ecclesiastes because this piece was something that was picked up when I was a late teenager and it was sung in all of the coffee houses. There is a time for everything. There is a season for everything, for every matter under heaven. There's a time to be born, and there's a time to die. There's a time to plant, and there's a time to pluck up what is planted. There's a time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. There's a time to mourn and a time to dance. There's a time to throw away stones and a time to gather stones together. There's a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to seek, a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to throw away. 
a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. What gain have the workers from their toil? I have seen the business that God has given to everyone to be busy with. God made everything suitable for its time and moreover put a sense of past and future into the minds of people. And yet they can't find out what God has done. Beginning to end. I know there is nothing better than to be happy and to enjoy oneself as long as we live. Moreover, it is God's gift that all should eat and drink and take their pleasure in all their toil. Thanks, Gord. I was listening to um, the CBC a couple of weeks ago, and Ian Hanneman Singh, who does cross-country checkup, was talking about the fact that uh, so often they're doing heavy shows and checking in across the country. And they thought that they would have a Sunday afternoon with a very simple question, which I'm going to invite you to this question. Very simple question. What's been a highlight of your summer? You can choose to describe that however you want. I invite you to turn around and talk to the people. What's been a highlight of your summer as we gather in this place again? Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you. If you want to go to the barbecue, we got to get this done. Thank you. Hope you share some of that. Uh, just a highlight. It's so good to remember. Uh, let us pray. We have heard voices in words and in song. May your voice speak to us in your unique way so that we might know and be called to the time that is now. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I, when I heard the news of the Queen's death on Wednesday, it was a moment that I will not forget, and our lives are filled with moments like that. We have events that come into our life, and we remember where we were when that happened. We were, I remember laying on the rocks in Muskoka, looking up at the sky in 1969 with binoculars, watching and waiting for the first person to land on the moon. I know where I was 21 years ago when we heard the news of 9-11. I remember the gymnasium I was in when the Canada-Russia hockey series happened in 1972. Don't worry if you're waiting to me get closer, I'm getting closer. 
I remember coming back from Naramata and learning about the death of Diana in 97. I remember in 1989 watching the Berlin Wall fall. I remember seeing Nelson Mandela walk in the streets freely for the first time in 1990. I remember where I was in this building on March 14, 2020, when the pandemic was called. And we couldn't believe, thinking we'd just be gone for a week or two, that two years has passed. I remember when we heard the words, I can't breathe, from George Floyd. And I remember the news of the discovery of 215 graves in Kamloops. Do you remember these events as you think of your life and where you were? And I remember as I sat on my couch this week cuddling my kittens and reading a book, and I got a text from Andrea that ended a text saying, P.S., the queen just died. It was to Anne and Sarah and I. It's kind of funny how it took me. How did I not know she was going to die? And why was that a surprise? And as I sat there for a few moments daydreaming, I thought back to Christmases when I was a kid. And it was a tradition in our family. My dad, I don't know why, perhaps my grandfather brought this tradition. We had to watch the Queen's address on Christmas morning. And I remember the struggle of lifting the TV into the living room and moving the rabbit ears and putting the tin foil on top and listening to her address. And I thought of many other occasions when I saw, witnessed the life of the Queen speaking about Annis Horribilis in a horrible year that she herself experienced. All week long I heard very many people mentioning the memories that they had of the Queen's death but when death enters in our life like that, we remember where we were. And as I sat on that living room couch, I got another text shortly thereafter, 15 minutes. And the text simply said, Dad just died. Can you come over? And it's from congregants who are here, not here this morning, but that text, Dad just died, can you come over? I was planned to go at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and they text and said, he just died, can you come over now? Two deaths noted. You know, one was 96 and one was 89. Doesn't matter whether you're 150, it's a death. And it hits us no matter what. You see, when death breaks into your life and mine, our world is turned upside down and suddenly it's as though time stops. Whether it's the horrific news of tragic deaths in northern Saskatchewan as we watched and heard the horror of that news as Tony brought into our minds, or whether it's uh, unexpected death in Balmoral at 96 or a suburban Calgary home and a peaceful death at 89. When death comes into our lives, suddenly we are left in this existential place. Where we ponder not just the person that died, but in a strange way, our own life, our own death, our own time. And we are left in this existential period where we think through our grief about our own life, death, and the time we're going to live our life. So as these deaths of Queen Elizabeth and Chuck Nowlin came to me, I was literally reading a book, this book, 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals. I hate time management. It's like the, it's my dead enemy. Here's the funny thing about the book, The 4,000 Weeks. I didn't have time to finish it. <laughs> yeah, I'm like... I don't have time to finish it. But it's a great picture, and I invite you to this book that was recommended to me by Terry and Becky Rock. 4,000 Weeks, Time Management for Mortals came out in 2021. Oliver Berkman has got beautiful pictures of bananas, how they're bright and green, and you all end up bruised just like this, like I am. This, this book on time management is really the 4,000 weeks you get to live if you live to 80. Anybody over 80 in the room? Put up your hand. You're on bonus time. There's some... <laughs> No, come on, is that all you two Pentlands? The Pentlands in the back row, I know. Yeah, I always think, here's, the, oh, there you go, over 80, nice. I always think if I get to 80, anything after is bonus time. But the book is this, the average lifespan is abundantly short, terrifyingly and insultingly short. Assuming you live to 80, you will have 4,000 weeks to live. 4,000 weeks to live. This book, 4,000 Weeks, I'll just read, is yet another book about making the best use of your time. But it's written in the belief that time management, as we know it, has failed miserably and that we need to stop pretending otherwise. This strange moment in history 
like right now in COVID time, when time feels so unmoored, might in fact provide an ideal opportunity to reconsider our relationship with time. Older thinkers in history have faced these challenges before us, and when their wisdom is applied to the present day, certain truths grow more truth clearly apparent. Productivity is a trap. That's a whole chapter. Becoming more efficient just makes you more rushed. I love that. And trying to clear your decks simply makes them fill up again faster. I have 31,000 unanswered emails in my phone. Nobody in the history of humanity has ever achieved a work-life balance. I love that. No one ever has. In fact, I was told in a leadership course, when you're off balance, you learn more than when you're balanced. <laughs> Whatever that may be, and you certainly won't get there by copying the six things successful people do before seven in the morning. <laughs> The day will never arrive when you finally have everything under control, when the flood of emails has been contained, when your to-do lists have stopped getting longer, when you're meeting all your obligations at work and in your home life, when nobody's angry with you for missing a deadline or dropping the ball, and when the fully optimized person you become can turn at long last to the things life really is supposed to be about. Let's start by admitting defeat. None of this is ever going to happen. But you know what? That's excellent news. And the book goes on, challenging our understanding of time, and I love it. It reminds us, and we all know it, that time is finitude. It's going to end. That my life's going to end, your life's going to end. There will be endings. The book reminds us that you can't spend time. You are time. Becky writes these words as she gave me the book to read. This is either the most spiritual book I've ever read or the most secular spiritual book I've ever read. And it's a nice blend of self-help and philosophical quest. The book is really a delightful look at turning upside down all the pressure we put on ourselves to get better, be more, fit more in, squish more on. And it's really about embracing the time we have. He writes, there are limits to our time. The day will never come when we empty our inbox. Yay. There will always be demands on your time or no near enough of them. Anything can happen anytime and there really are limits to our time. Work-life balance is impossible. And so is productivity. Productivity is also revealed as a fairly dubious modern virtue. Don't you love those people who want to tell you how busy they are all the time and you walk away feeling like you're, you're a loser because you're not? <laughs> he writes, the Latin word for business, negotium, translate to not leisure. Reflecting the view that work was a de deviation from the higher calling of, of ease. If we make leisure only another arena for self-improvement, then it sacrifices the present in favor of an imagined future. Leisure should, in fact, be sought after an objective that honors a full life. When I was reading this book, I was thinking about the book that I mentioned to you before by Mark Kingwell. He wrote a book called The World We Want, and on page 218 is the sub-answer. He was studying what made people happy, and what he discovered as he studied people, he's a philosopher at uh, U of T, he says that people were seeking to be happy and they bought more stuff, but they were never happier because of what he said they wanted was meaning. They were all starved and craving to have meaningful time. He says it happens in four ways. One is creative leisure. Isn't that not true? It's creative leisure that brings us meaning. Connection to family and friends. When we have relationships, we feel like we are in quality time. Third, commitment to common social projects. When you're getting out of your own ego, out of your own little world to a bigger world and helping another, you experience a sense of meaning. And the fourth, he says, the last and most important, and that's why you go to church, time to reflect. And when you go to church, you daydream. You count the light bulbs, you count this, you daydream about your life but you're engaging in the important gift of reflection, which is what this book is all about. He is calling people to the present. This is so common these days as we look at the world's religious traditions, whether it's Buddhism or Taoism or Christianity, the call is to the now. 
to the very moment that we are in, whether we call it boring or spectacular, is a call to that moment. It's not a call necessarily to do extreme sports and put it on your phone or cram as much as you can into your calendar and tell people how busy you are. It might actually be a quality moment to drop things, to stop things, to accept limits and embrace moments. He says we've got to accept the finitude of life, the finitude of our life. The text that I use most often at the funerals I do is from the book of Ecclesiastes that Gord read. It's the book of wisdom. It's the preacher or philosopher who looks at life. And if you go to this book, and I invite you to read it, it begins really strangely. It says life is useless. Life is empty. Life is pointless. What a great way to start a book, hey? <laughs> it's like striving after the wind. And then something happened, and I'd love to know what happened in the philosopher's life when chapter 3 comes around, because that beautiful poem you heard a moment ago talks about time and the seasons of time, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to plant and a time to harvest. Go back and look at the patterns of time, clearly looking that in our finitude there is time, both kinds of time. Now, the Hebrew people had a concept of time that's so important to get. One is chronos time. When's this sermon going to be over? Seconds, minutes, hours, day timers, chronological times that can be a weight in our life. And we all live in chronological time. But they have another time called kairos time, quality time, sacred time, or Richard Rohr would call deep time. Deep time, he writes, is the time we're talking about when the world seems to stop momentarily. It can be measured in deep exhales, like Andrea brought us into that worship. A shared laugh or a colorful sunset. A time where we move forward in the present untethered by any moving clock or calendar is a Kairos moment. Kairos moments are when you say, oh my God, this is it, I finally get it. Or you say this as you sit back at a table with friends or family and you just pull back and you look and you go, it doesn't get better than this. These are the moments that perhaps we try to create or perhaps they surprise us with their grace, but they're the moments that are deep time. And we all know these deep times exist. They may be few and far between, he says, but sometimes a kairos moment in life, one can feed your soul like fuel for many months at a time. There is an element of serendipity, a feeling of ceasing, an opportunity for the moment, and in those precious moments where time stands still and everything feels possible, we are in kairos time. And our 4,000 weeks are filled with those times. The truth is this book is a self-help book and it's a good book, which I will finish with time. <laughs> but it reminds us in September, which can be like December without the presence, that we need to consider our time. What am I not gonna do and celebrate? What am I gonna do and celebrate? It is the most important text I do at funerals because at funerals we remember people's lives for the Kairos moments in their life. It might be in their workplace that brings joy. It might be at a hike they did. It might be an award they received. It might be in a conversation they had, but all of them point to Kairos times. September is a time to imagine, to rethink, to return. And each of us are called to consider how we might live more fully in Kairos time. And so I have made a commitment to myself, and it's very simple. This year, I'm gonna commit to being more present. I'm gonna commit to be more present to myself first, to pay attention to my body, to my spirit, 
to the creator who's inside me and you. I'm going to pay attention and be present to me. I'm going to be present as a father. I had to really think about that. When I want to rush, I'm going to stop. And I'm going to be more present to you as best I'm able. I have a habit of being a hummingbird. Woo hoo, woo hoo. I don't know what a slow bird is, maybe a stork. <laughs> but I'm going to try to be more present to those around me. So, present to myself, to my kids and to my work, which is my life. I don't know what you're going to do, but the invitation is to consider how might I experience and be surprised by Kairos time. I close with a poem which I'm beginning to love by Mary Oliver, Wild Geese. Close your eyes if you want. This is, this is for me. You don't have to be good. You don't have to walk on your knees for a hundred miles through the desert repenting. You only have to let the soft animal of your body love what it loves. Tell me about your despair, yours, and I'll tell you about mine. Meanwhile, the world goes on. Meanwhile, the sun and the clear pebbles of the rain are moving across the landscapes, over the prairies and the deep trees, the mountains and the rivers. Meanwhile, the wild geese high in the clean blue air are heading home again. Whoever you are, no matter how lonely, the world offers itself to your imagination, calls to you like the wild geese, harsh and exciting, over and over, announcing your place in the family of things. May God be with us all. Amen. I invite us to our final hymn.
to you this week. Uh, this is both blessing on you uh, among us and also blessing on the food. We hope you'll hang around for the barbecue to meet others, to talk about your summer, to talk about your time. Let us go trusting that we are known and loved by the Creator. That yes, our time is finite, but it can be and will be filled with Kairos moments. May we celebrate and know this always. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, Mother of us all. Amen.